The most significant continued industry calls are for a ban on unjustified uh, localization requirements. How adequately, adequately does this week's proposal address these concerns, Julia? And uh, does anything change from earlier in the year when plans look less certain? Well, the most important thing for me was that uh, the the interaction with the general data protection regulation has been clarified. I mean, the way that I see it at the moment uh, is um, that, well, there's a ban on, on unjustified uh, uh, data localization requirements. At the same time, I think there is a, a notification, which uh, is always a good idea to that it will be easier to find out what requirements exist in the first place I mean this I think is, is, a, is a useful exercise to have so I really don't have that many complaints about uh, the the localization part of the proposal it's really I think uh, uh, in the area of portability and making sure that this also works for all kinds of end users is where I have more to criticize than uh, the the data localization element as such I think it's it's uh, as as long as it's made clear that there's a distinction with personal data um, there I think it's not such a bad idea to, to legislate there and clarify it. Guido, does this go far enough with the, 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 the concept? I mean as I said before I think you know reasonably this is probably one of the best things that the Commission could come up with it doesn't mean that it's perfect I think you know we could uh, we could go further uh, and maybe you know the process will will hopefully lead us there I think it's reasonable that you know there's a public security uh, exception. Uh, in my experience, the problem with those exceptions is how are they then used by member states? And you know, if we look at other single market areas, they tend to use them ex very extensively. Uh, so, at some point, maybe we we'll need to be clear what that means. And also, personally, I have another question, which is you know, there's a notification, which is great. I think you know that's that's probably one of the best ways to achieve it, but it doesn't really say what happens. I mean, member states have an obligation to explain and justify why they are putting forward certain data localization measures, but it doesn't really give the Commission a power to actually prevent them from doing something that the Commission believes is not appropriate or is not sufficiently justified. If we had that included in the proposal, I think it would be a very strong instrument in defense of the single market. Yeah, well, France and Germany, and to a lesser extent Italy, they weren't massive fans of, of this uh, element earlier in the year. What's changed since then? Good goodness, I couldn't tell you that. Do you know, <laughs> Lucas? You probably know, do you? <laughs> you, you never, ever, ever ask the presidency to comment on what... <laughs> <laughs> Did you observe What's any change? Changed? Is there a change of position? I can observe that everyone in the council now supports the proposal, mm. um, and I can observe that that wasn't necessarily the case um, before you know, the election. Nine months? No, nine months ago. I'm, I let me put it this way: I, I would imagine that probably a country that elected its foreign minister of economy, who previously set the policies, the president was not going to have a huge shift in policy. But no, I'm, I think we had we had a very positive, actually, collectively, the member states, positive interaction with the Commission, where, I mean, there was a fairly good stakeholder engagement process, but we also had a number of structured dialogues among the member states, um, three or four of them basically starting in January or February and going through the summer, um, which transparency is good. But sometimes you also do need to, especially when you are touching on security issues, get the member states in a room on their own with the Commission there. Okay. And that, I think, really helped because we could work through a lot of the issues. I think there was a lot of fear and uncertainty about what the proposal might do. And by working through mm -hmm. those things before the Commission came with the proposal, we could actually ground some of those fears. So I would say that the, the fears the member states have are now addressed to some extent, but we're going to have to go through this proposal and see what Julia happens in the ordinary <laughs> legislative process. No. No. Julia, okay, just uh, on this, I want to ask as well, is that, uh, is this just about security or is this protectionism as well? Was that the real reason that France and Germany were opposed? I, I would just like to, to come back on that last point. I have to say I feel a little bit jealous as a co-legislator. I wish the European Parliament's concerns and uh, ideas were taken into account by the Commission before even putting forward a proposal. We're just told, well, you know, you can, you can put table amendments when it's out there. So, uh, I mean, we've had uh, cases where the Commission did not put forward a proposal despite a very positive evaluation in a consultation because one member state didn't want to have it. And I, I have to wonder, I mean, where's the balance between
between the council and the parliament there if certain member states can stop legislation before it's even put on the table. So I, I don't want to speculate about why certain member states may not have wanted this, but what I do wonder is why should it stop the commission from presenting a proposal if council can debate it afterwards? If they really don't want it, they can reject it. Okay. Okay. No, I was going to say, I'm not, I, I'm not, and part of the reason why I'm unable to answer the question is because I'm not aware, I've never seen any analysis of, of reactions from different member states, and as far as I'm concerned, all of the reactions that we made were through the, uh, because of the Inca Impact Assessment Board or because of the um, consultation that we did, and okay, maybe some of that came from France and Germany, but I'm not actually conscious of that, so, I mean, certainly there have been no meetings with particular countries or anything okay. like that. Guido, yeah, you sit on both sides of this, so uh, you're, you know, it's the industries in these countries that are driving, not necessarily the member states, member yeah. states are the messenger. Look, since, since we're fairly satisfied with the proposal, I think, you know, we didn't really need to go into this assessment, I mean, but uh, there's essentially three reasons why, you know, data localization measures take place. One is protectionism, obviously. The second one is, uh, you mentioned it, the, the need to make sure that enforcement authorities can access the data. And that's been addressed by the proposal quite uh, well, I would say. Um, the third reason is the misunderstanding that data are somehow safer if stored into a certain location. Uh, maybe what happened over this time is that there was a clearer understanding. Th the third reason is really, you know, nonsense. Um, the second reason, as I said, has been addressed. The first reason remains there. Um, if I look at it from a maybe global angle, as you know, as ITI we we tend to do, I think there's a very good uh, political reason to leave that aside, which is that you know Europe has to deal internationally with other jurisdictions where we wouldn't want to see data localization taking place at all. So it would be very difficult for Europe to go to other regions in the world and tell them you shouldn't localize or you should require data localization if Europe itself is not able to impose that on its member states.